Hello and welcome to another presentation by the London Transport Museum Friends. This time our focus is on London Underground, on London Underground rolling stock to be precise. Our speaker is Malcolm DeBell. Malcolm has had a lifelong career in rolling stock engineering and was involved in the commissioning and later the refurbishment of many types of underground train. Malcolm's presentation is entitled 100 Years at Tube Trains. I'll leave it to him to explain how a career of some 50 years is expanded to cover a whole century. Before I hand over to Malcolm, can I say as usual that if you're watching this talk during the premiere, please put your questions and comments to Malcolm using the chat function. If you're watching at a later date, leave your comments as we do welcome feedback. So Malcolm, over to you. Thanks, Barry. As he said, I'm Malcolm Dobell, and I'm going to talk about my career in London Underground. I've talked, called it 100 Years of Tube Trains. Um, why 100 years? Well, that will become clear as we talk. Um, it, it's going to cover episodes from my career and hopefully talk more about the engineering and the assets than it does about me. Um, I think that we will see a huge number of changes, probably none more so than in digital technology. And if you think back to 1969 when I started my career, what we're doing now would have been pretty impossible, certainly at any reasonable cost. You'll see that I've highlighted my career, and this pretty much serves as the agenda for our talk tonight. I started work in 1969, and I retired in 2014, although there'll be a slide right at the end of talking about the things I've done since I retired. Old engineers don't just give up, they just fade away over the years. During my early days as a trainee, I had the enormous privilege of being paid to go to university. It was called a sandwich course, and I would spend six months of the year uh, at university and six months of the year training. Uh, the first year, uh, I think my, my biggest um, and most exciting visit was a couple of weeks spent at Golders Green Depot, where I started to learn about the PCM equipment PCM equipment is the traction equipment that was used on all the trains from 1938 through to D-stock in the late 1970s. It was in 1971 that I had a training assignment at Eden Common Depot. And David Thornton, the depot engineer of the time, asked me to inspect the saloon of the last Q-stock train that was to run in its last farewell journey and identify key items requiring repair. As one of the vehicles was a Q23 stock, this is how I claim the earliest date of my 100 years. These were the days when one often travelled standing in the doorway, helping a sticky door to close. And it was seeing Jeff Marshall's recent film about the Isle of Wight 1938 tube stock that brought these memories back. 1938 tube stock from his film clearly still suffers these same problems, largely eradicated from all the trains running on the underground today. It was that year during my time training in the workshops at Acton that I came across an experiment to test out the concept of articulation. Articulation was quite rare on metros at the time, but was gaining popularity in trams. This two car set was made from two driving motor cars of the last of the 1935 prototype cars. The cars have been shortened by cutting off the training ends between the couplers and the body mounted transverse member which supported the bogey. Each car had traction equipment feeding two motors from 1967 tube stock on the outer bogies. And as far as I recall, the traction equipment worked in parallel only. And certainly when I drove it on the test track, under supervision of course, that it set off at a pretty smart pace. The articulated set featured prototype aluminium bogies, which you see in the bottom left illustration here. It was an interesting experiment. It involved primary suspension made from 
metalastic chevrons and metacone secondary suspension. The articulated bogey was steel and had similar suspension. The height of the articulated bogey together with the coupled mounting above it meant that the floor over the bogey was much higher than normal and the door between the cars was even shorter than normal. One of the things I never found out was whatever became of these bogies after the trials were completed, but there was absolutely no more talk about articulation until the late 1990s. When I finished training, I joined the auxiliary equipment section in the design division. Now this was at the time when London Underground acted as its own main contractor for trains. They might engage 30 or more suppliers of parts which would be shipped to Metro Camel who supplied the car bodies and usually the bogies. One of my responsibilities was heating and ventilation. The C69 stock had used fan heaters mounted in the doorways and this arrangement had been much criticised. The fan heaters were in the ceilings and the airflow through the fan heaters was small. This had led the designers somehow to miss the point that hot air rises. Consequently, the ceilings were warm and the floors were cold. I was charged with working with LU's heater and fan suppliers to come up with something better. The heaters were integrated with the seat risers and with the draft screens and the fans were mounted in the ceiling with the air intake from slots in the roof. The photo shows the auxiliary equipment section boss, the late Tony Bennett, examining one of the first train's fans prior to the type test. Come the early 80s, and I was promoted to the rank of senior executive assistant with two responsibilities which didn't really have any relevance to each other, but they were very, very useful ways of learning different skills. Firstly, I was responsible for compiling the Chief Mechanical Engineers Department's capital budget. And I was also responsible for managing the Car Records Office. The first role involved talking to all the engineers in the department and understanding what their needs were. The second was actually managing the staff of the Car Records Office. They were, as I say, quite different roles. Project management was just coming into popularity at the time. The only project managers we had in the department were those for the major projects, such as the D-Stock or the 1983 Tube Stock and the engineer's vehicles. The others were very much well, the engineer who was doing most of the work just got on with the work and reported the finances occasionally. There was a requirement, though, to appoint a project manager to every project. Very much in the vein of fools rush in where angels fear to tread. I knew which engineers did most of the work on the various projects, so I nominated them as the project managers and then told them about their immense good fortune. It was only much later that anyone thought about any training. The Car Records Office was led very efficiently by a perfect gentleman called Ranjit Cruz Fernando, who ended up working for me. He was managing a team of people who were going through a process of computerising all their records. On the left, you will see banks of card index cards, which held all the information about which cars had which motor alternators, wheels, axles and so forth. And that was all being transferred to computers, very early IBM systems. Why was this important? Well, it was critical to maintain which pieces of equipment were where. Because through the 50s and probably long before, traction equipment had been prone to having systemic failures. And equally, you could get batch faults on axles and wheels. And if you've discovered an axle with a defect in it, then you very rapidly want to discover all the other axles in the same batch and get them checked. So we had to make this transition 
whilst ensuring that all the record integrity was maintained. It was only later where the responsibility for actually inputting all this information was transferred directly to the depots, uh, which eliminated one link in the chain. Next, I was promoted to be project manager for the 1983 tube stock after my predecessor, Peter Longhurst, had been promoted. LU was going through a period of financial crisis at that time, and although the Jubilee line needed over 30 trains, only 15 trains were bought. And through trimming of schedules and fleet cascades, the 15 trains was enough to allow the remaining 1938 tube stock to be withdrawn. 1983 tube stock had been conceived as a tube version of D-stock. But in the interests of commercial competition, a number of standard components, particularly the traction equipment and the motor alternators, were placed with new suppliers. And this added to the teething troubles of the train. Ultimately, no trains after the 1983 tube stock used camshaft traction equipment or rotary converters. All this happened in 1983 and 4, using the process I described earlier, where London Underground was the main contractor. And it was my responsibility to make sure that 30 plus suppliers all delivered their parts to Metro Camel on time. And we were so successful in that endeavor that Metro Camel had to hire an additional uh, storage unit to store all the parts we shipped to them. In the early 1980s, there were changes in policies which led to customer numbers increasing dramatically. And by the mid 1980s, it was obvious that more new trains were needed. So it decided to buy more 1983 tube stocks to complete the Jubilee Line fleet. And it was also decided to use Metro Camel as the main contractor. And I was brought in to sort out the transfer of all the information that Metro Camel would require to buy the equipment that was necessary and to draft many of the schedules that would be used to manage the contract. And all this had to happen in a very short time. The important thing to ensure was that parts bought for the second batch of trains were interchangeable with the parts bought for the first batch of trains. And I think it's fair to say that we largely succeeded in that endeavor. Some of the things that you would have seen in Metro Camel when the 1983 tube stock was being built would have been the car bodies being manufactured. And it was amongst the last of the trains that Metro Camel actually manufactured themselves from scratch using lengths of raw steel or aluminium. Uh, later trains were built by subcontractors to Metro Camel. They would build a side or a roof or an underframe. Those parts would be shipped to Metro Camel who would then assemble them. But here you see on the left an underframe for a tube train which shows very clearly where the wheels would be poking up through the floor um, because of the restricted uh, low gauge of the trains. If you had seen an underframe for a surface stock, then that frame would have been almost completely flat. One of the particular teething troubles we discovered quite early on with the 1983 tube stock was a problem with gauging. If you look at the photograph on the left, you'll see a, an elegant pole that runs from the draft screen on one side of the door all the way up along the ceiling and down the other side. And that was an innovation made in the interest of making the cars a little more elegant. Unfortunately, we discovered or be described as an emergent property in today's language, that the vertical poles that we used formerly actually added some rigidity to the body. With these poles, the slight flexibility of the curved sides of the train allowed the roof to sink slightly and that meant that when put through the gauge the roof was low but unfortunately the body sides were slightly foul of the gauge 
And this led to a modification, which you can see on the right hand side of the picture, where vertical poles have been uh, reinstated. What we've learned since, of course, is that if we'd been able to use modern gauging techniques where the assessment is made more dynamically rather than statically, it's entirely possible that we would have been able to accept slight out of gauge of the trains without having to do any modifications at all. But that's something we learn from hindsight. We also had some problems with the bogies. In the early parts of my career, problems with bogies were quite well known. And as a digression, if when I walked through the truck shop at Acton Works, you would routinely see welders repairing cracks in the bogey frames, particularly of 1938 tube stock. The bogies on the 1983 tube stock looked very much more substantial than any tube stock before. And we were hoping that they would be free from any problems. Problems have been something that had dogged LU bogies for many, many years. Then one day, a colleague, Tim Poole, who was in our structures and dynamics section, popped in to see me. He'd been working on another supplier's uh, trial bogies and had identified a problem. As the trial bogies design was similar to the 1983 tube stop bogies, he'd also put some monitoring kit on the 1983 tube stop bogie and discovered that the stresses were so high in the areas shown on the photo above, highlighted in yellow, that cracking was likely in the next six to 12 months. He was quite surprised when I thanked him, but I explained that all my previous experience was that we'd had to deal with cracks after they'd been detected and not before they'd been detected. And his discovery had given us six to 12 months to do something about the problem before the cracks appeared. Modifications involving fitting reinforcing plates were successful and these bogies continued until the train's premature withdrawal when the Jubilee line was extended in 1998 and 1999. A small digression. Um, one of the things that I did in my spare time was perform with the London Transport Players. Uh, you may have heard a uh, fellow friend, John Self, talking about this along the, along the way. And members of the LT Players were occasionally invited to do publicity events for London Underground. Here you will see me alongside some fellow LT players and some waxworks from Madame Tussauds next door, where they were relaunching Baker Street Station after the old wooden panelling had been stripped away, the original brickwork cleaned and repaired, and critical areas tiled with tiles showing the Sherlock Holmes motif. The launch was very successful. We got some publicity in the press, although I did get some comments from colleagues who were wondering which of us were the waxworks. After the 1983 tube stock, I spent a short period of time as project manager for the engineers' vehicles, something that, again, that my colleague John Self had done before me. You see me standing in front of a 1985 battery locomotive. Just six were bought and they used traction equipment from the same supplier as uh, supplied the 1983 tube stock and traction motors from the COCP stock. They were built by Metro Camel. They did suffer two particular problems. These, I think, led to their early uh, withdrawal from service. One, they were less powerful than the locomotives they were supposed to be replacing, which meant that they struggled to carry the same loads. And secondly, they were a lot more complicated, therefore difficult for the maintainers to understand and maintain. Another thing, and this is the photographs on the right, was a, an idea that came along from time to time of providing engineers trains in a more flexible form than hitherto. The idea was that some rolling chassis, possibly powered chassis with cabs that would be built, 
So it'd be powered under frames, which could then have bodies rather like the containers you see on ships and lorries, but with all sorts of different applications installed in them, mounted on the chassis, depending on what the job was. One day it could be a hopper, next time it could be flat cars or a sandite train or something like that. This led to a conversation with British Rail Engineering Limited, who at the time were also looking for other outlets for their rail bus or pacer product. As a result, a number of us from Acton were invited by Braille to travel on a pacer. And I have to say, this remains my one and only pacer trip to this day. I'm not disappointed about that, I hasten to add. And then I moved on to help get the 1986 tube stock into service. The 1986 tube stock, for anyone who's not familiar with it, was three four-car prototype trains, each with slightly different technology. Two came from Metro Camel, one with GEC equipment and one with equipment from Swiss supplier Brown Bavari that eventually became ABB and ultimately Bombardier. And secondly, a train from British Rail Engineering Limited, which used brush traction equipment. The Brell train also used steering bogies and had resilient wheels. The red train was the one with GC equipment, the green train was the one with Brown Bavaria equipment, and the blue train was the Brell one. Entry into service had been somewhat delayed because of various teething troubles, but what you see is the inaugural run attended by the then Minister of Transport, David Mitchell, which was not without its problems, not least of which was that the auto announcer telling you which stations you were stopping at got out of sync with itself and uh, there were various other problems along the way. But it got into service and ran reasonably happily for about a year before derailment caused it to be taken out of service. The picture on the top right shows the very first time a train with solid state chopper equipment had run in the tunnel. At the time, the signaling engineering colleagues were very concerned that the interference from the chopper equipment might cause the signals some difficulty. The worst might be turning signals from red to green behind it. These were issues were eventually argued away and the test run was the first time we'd managed to demonstrate it and it worked really successfully. My last task on this particular project was to work with a colleague Richard Minter on the first draft of the specification for what became the 1992 tube stock before handing over to the 1992 tube stock project team was just being formed at the time. And this was the first tube train that would be all aluminium. It had all the axles motored. It had the chopper control and separately excited DC motors. A very significant innovation was a train control and monitoring system where a number of separate commands would be sent down the same wire this is quite normal today, but was very innovative in the late 1980s when it was first proposed. Uh, it had automatic announcements, outside sliding doors, and in-cab platform CCTV with cameras on the platform and the monitors in the saloon. Although the picture shows a nice flat screen monitor, when we first started, we had to use cathode ray tubes and uh, that was quite a challenge to incorporate those in the small space of a tube train. This led me to being promoted to the program manager effectively for pretty much all the works other than the 1992 tube stock that was being carried out by the uh, Chief Mechanical Engineers Department. A significant job was to improve the fire safety of all LU's existing trains following the tragedy at King's Cross. 
At the time, the standard interior of a train was clad in melamine-faced hardboard or polyester glass reinforced plastic. Their fire performance was okay, not great. The exteriors, which were unpainted aluminium at the time, were also suffering from the graffiti craze leading to the decision to paint them. 1959 and 1962 tube socks were old and due for renewal soon, so they just had their ceilings replaced and public address fitted. But more extensive work was proposed for 1967, 1972 AC and D stocks. The late Bill Clark was development director at the time and was far sighted enough to see that trains could be significantly upgraded for marginal extra cost over the basic cost of replacing materials. This led to prototypes being built and the interiors were designed by respected industrial designers, including Jones Garrard, Transport Design International, Preactive, DCA, Warwick Design, and so on. The photo shows an exhibition of the prototypes held in about 1991 in Rickmansworth sidings. C-Stock was designed by Preactive and it was arguably the most challenging. The interior of the original C-Stock with its large, large draft screens and transverse seats was widely held to be claustrophobic and there was desire for an all longitudinal layout. Windows in the ends of the cars were also one of those good ideas that came from a brainstorming session on the design with all the key players sitting in an existing car. The prototype provided three seats on each side of each seat bay. And while these conformed to all the seat size standards at the time, with an armrest between each seat, those in charge of the business case said that the reduction in number of seats ruined the business case. So with some colleagues from LU's drawing office, we did a series of what might be called controlled fiddles, which we discussed with Creative, and it involved moving the draft screen slightly closer to the doorway, reducing each seat's width by a few millimetres, and eliminating two of the armrests. A mock-up was built and installed at the Hammersmith and City Line offices at Edgware Road. And I'm a large chap, and another large chap from the design office joined me side by side to demonstrate to the line's general manager, Harry Williams, that the design was satisfactory. Before and after photos in the slide show the result. There were some complex structural issues to overcome, but we got there courtesy of RFS in Doncaster. A comparatively more straightforward conversion was carried out on the 1967 tube stock, but equally, it illustrates the scale of change on a tube stock. I am sometimes asked why we didn't fit end windows on these trains. And in truth, it's simply that it didn't occur to us as a good idea until it was too late in the contractual process. So we made do with the circular lights that were fitted at the end of the car, uh, which were incorporated in the first prototype. Moving on into the 1990s, and this illustrates the building of Northern Nine 1995 tube stock, but could also, is, is quite similar to the Jubilee Line 1996 stock. Northern Line was badged the misery line in the early 1990s, and another financial issue at the time, but there was no money to buy new trains. I think partly because most money was committed to the Jubilee Line extension. ABB and Braille were being very entrepreneurial and they proposed a lease deal using a seven car variant of the 1992 tube stock. LU, with government support, accepted this as a very early public private initiative activity, but of course it was necessary to go to open tender. Specification was written for a seven car train, but I suggested a clause along the lines of other configurations 
currently in manufacture would be considered. GEC Alstom, as it was then, one was a variant of Jubilee Line 1996 tube stock, which of course was a six car train. The Northern Line train is quite a lot different from the Jubilee Line train. For example, the bogies, the suspension, the traction package, compressor, the cab layout, and the train control and management system are all different from the Jubilee Line. But those trains are still running successfully and happily today. About 1998, I was appointed as Chief Rolling Stock Engineer for LU, with overall responsibility for the standards and assurance of the entire fleet. What we didn't know at the time was this was going to be a period of virtually cons continuous change. The points I've highlighted on this slide illustrate some of the base load of the routine work. And... Uh, some of the things I inherited, for example, the pictures of the space train, which have been developed at the behest of my predecessor, John Vint, led to things that would be uh, perhaps contracted later on, but were tied up with events that took place in the uh, early 2000s that led to it being shelved for a long while. I was, had the great opportunity to learn through this role, serving on the adhesion working group where I got to meet a large number of people from the mainline railways who were dealing with the problems of leaves on the line each autumn, by working with different colleagues from the mainline industry on the standards committee, and working in the UITP rolling stock where I got to visit railways all over the world and see different solutions to problems that we might be suffering in London. I was also involved in LU's multidisciplinary team, trying to improve safety at the platform train interface, which at the time was seen as the biggest risk area on the whole of the underground. One of the challenges of the time was convincing the regulators that the changes we had made to improve the fire safety of the trains were sufficient and suitable. The fire brigade are the regulators of fire safety for the underground, except they didn't have any purview over the trains. The trains could only be regulated by the Her Majesty's Railway Inspectorate which is now part of the Office of Rail and Road. The fire brigade were concerned of the deeply upholstered seats and they were scared that a train over which they had no authority might turn up in a station as a raging inferno full of these what looked like sofas that were ablaze. Eventually, it was agreed with them that we'd stage a demonstration of the far safety of the seats. And that was uh, led by my colleagues, Peter Longhurst and Gary Duggan. Uh, and we did it on a 1992 tube stock at Hainault Depot. That, that this particular train had been kept out of service for a long time after an accident in service. We just agreed with the fire brigade that we would demonstrate two scenarios. One was something placed on a seat and set on fire. The other one was having the seat slashed and stuffed with newspaper and set on fire. The material we put on the seat was a standard test piece that's used for assessing the fire safety of materials. Uh, it's a 126 gram wooden test piece called a crib. And uh, the normal test would be one of these, but we were sufficiently confident of the result that we actually put eight of them on the seat. That represented one kilogram of timber. The middle photo shows the eight cribs burning furiously. And the outer photograph on the left 
shows the slashed and stuffed seat burning furiously. The end result was when the fuel was used up, the, the timber or the newspapers, as the case may be, the fire went out and that all had been lost was the upholstery immediately on the surface of the seats. The fire brigade went away really satisfied with the results and I personally think that this test helped us when it time came to justify the use of open wide gangway trains uh, some 10 years later. Then there was the Chancery Lane incident. Um, it was on a Saturday in January 2003 when I was at home and I heard there had been a derailment at Chancery Lane on the Central Line. Derailments in service, as you can appreciate, are always serious and those in tunnels more so. I was rapidly in touch with the network control centre and it became apparent that the motor had become detached from the train and the train had derailed as it ran over the motor. I went straight to site. The event and its consequences carried on in one form or another for the next 10 years. What you can see in the photograph is the motor sitting in the space between the rails, accompanied with a lot of debris, chewed up sleepers and so forth. On the right hand side, you'll see the train as it came to a stand in the platform. The door that was on the platform had struck the tunnel and become detached. On site, I recommended to the line's general manager, Bob Bayman, that the fleet be withdrawn from service temporarily while we consider the next steps. And you might reasonably ask why I made that recommendation. And going into some of the details, the photo here, the picture in the middle, shows how the motor was attached to the bogey. Um, basically, four bolts are used to attach the motor to the plate that you could see, which is called the support bracket. And then two safety brackets are attached to the motor after it's been installed. Uh, as safety brackets. There had been some previous incidents of motors coming loose or partially detached together with gearbox damage and it was thought that the motors coming loose were damaging the gearboxes. A variety of increasingly stringent mitigations have been put in place to manage the situation. It was clear that for whatever reason these mitigations had not been sufficient because another motor had become detached, and hence the temporary withdrawal. When everyone as part of the team sat together and discussed what further mitigations could be put in place, we were unable to come up with anything that could be done quickly, and hence the fleet remained out of service for several weeks whilst some redesign was carried out. And this led to serious problems for my operating colleagues while they organised major changes to uh, arrangements in East and West London to help people who would normally be served by the central line get to different railheads in order to be able to continue their journeys. What we did through the design was take each and every traction motor and make sure that the mountings were to design. So the threads in the holes were satisfactory, that the mating faces were flat and in good condition, and that we used a new sort of bolt that would absolutely ensure that the right clamping force was in place. And my colleagues also designed much more robust safety brackets, which you can see in the top left and top right of the photograph, to hold the motor if indeed it did come adrift. Now this, we thought, would manage the problem, but we still didn't completely understand why the motors were coming loose in the first place. 
And the witnesses to the investigation had described how they'd heard the motor th or noises of something thrashing about underneath the train as the train was heading towards Chancery Lane. We decided to run a test train from Rysip to Hainault with all the modifications in place, except that we left out the mounting bolts. The motor was just hanging from its safety brackets. And we no observed no sign of any th thrashing about that the witnesses had described. In fact, the motor just sat there and did its job. So we had to think about what, why these things were seeing so much force that it was causing the bolts to come loose. To cut a long story short, instead of failing motor mounting leading to gearbox failure, the problem was the other way around. The failure of gearbox bearings would lead the pinion not being contained properly, causing the thrashing about noises and severe dynamic loads that would quickly destroy the motor mounts. This led to a final solution. The final solution was much more extensive than just a new motor mount. By then we'd also discovered that there were cracks appearing in the bogies uh, around the area of the motor mounts and there was no reasonably practicable repair that could be done that would restore the motor, the motor mounting to the correct strength. So again, to cut another long story short, we placed a contract with Siemens in Graz, Austria, to make new bogey frames and to supply new parts for existing gearboxes and to make the motor mounting really satisfactory. The top picture with the green and the orange shows a new orange and grey plate that is permanently bolted to the motor. This is then slid into the motor mounting on the bogey so that the motor is absolutely contained even if the fixing bolts aren't fitted. It's then bolted in place with nuts and bolts to ensure that the motor stays put and never goes anywhere. We also provided a new flexible coupling between the motor and the gearbox and new gearbox bearing and pinion arrangement. The assembly of the bogies and the gearboxes were carried out in Acton Works. I have to say we still didn't completely understand why the original bearings had been failing. They were failing in a component that should have been seeing no load. And it was only in the 2010s that we discovered what was going on. And it was uh, after my own daughter, Zoe, had joined the underground as a, she graduated as an engineer and was involved in designing a test rig to test the gearboxes and able to put some telemetry on the inside of the bearing that eventually showed why the bearing component was failing. I wish we'd known that in 2003, but that's with the benefit of perfect hindsight. It was only in 2013 when my colleague Peter Sires, who'd been in charge of all the works on the Central Line trains after the Chancery Lane derailment, was able to finally close out the project. The 2000s were graced with the public-private partnership. And one of the things I was involved with was um, developing the specifications for and evaluating the bids for the PPP as part of a very large team because the PPPs were huge contracts. I think it's fair to say that in that time I spent more time with lawyers and the whole of the rest of the time of my career put together. One of the curious things of the PPP contract was it never mentioned the purchase of new trains at all. 
And yet, nearly 1,900 cars were ordered during the currency of the PPP. Equally, the specification for the trains was put together by the manufacturers. Again, very unusual. We then had the challenge that the PPP suppliers failed part way through the contracts. That's not actually quite true. Metronet went into administration and for a variety of reasons, the tube lines contract was ended. It will be a whole lecture to explain more about why those things happened. But in spite of that, the new trains, which you see here, the 2009 stock on the right and the S stock on the left, have proved to be a credit to everyone involved. A huge amount of teamwork went on between LU and Metronet, between Metronet and Bombardier, the supplier. And they are now amongst the most reliable trains on the underground. The Victoria line in particular showed the benefit of modern systems thinking. So the original Victoria line showed the huge benefit of systems thinking in the 60s. In the 2000s, the upgrade of the Victoria line delivered more trains in service with shorter run times between stations, so overall faster journey times for people. More capacity overall, both in each train and because there were more trains running. So the service went up from 27 trains an hour in the peak to 36 trains an hour in the peak. But overall, less energy was used by a significant amount, some 16%. The other thing to note is S-Stock and the great benefit that fitting air conditioning has brought to travel on the subsurface railway. My time with the Rolling Stock Subcommittee of the International Association of Public Transport, UITP, involved tours of other organisations' metros and allowed me to see many different solutions to problems. Indeed, a visit to New York influenced resolving a long-standing track-train interface problem at Piccadilly Circus, and visits to Stockholm and uh, Hamburg influenced thinking about what's become the order for the new Piccadilly Line trains. This membership allowed me to see the Hong Kong Airport Express Line before it opened, learn about the complexity of rubber-tired trains firsthand, enjoy a German Pils on a Hamburg Metro bar train, I hasten to add when in Rome, do as the Romans do, and travel in a hundred year old preserved electric train in Budapest. I also saw the German Railways Intercity Express train depot in Hamburg. This had the extraordinary facility to be able to uh, replace any bogey on the two power cars and any wheel set on the intermediate cars so that was 12 intermediate cars and two power cars um, in the layover between duties without lifting the cars. So that effectively there were two bogey drops under each power car and four wheel set drops under each trailer car. Possibly the most extraordinary was a visit to the Met Moscow Metro in 2005 and uh, when they took us everywhere by coach and we always had to beg them to allow us to ride the metro. What you see here is the old trams in Lisbon on the top right, the bar train in Hamburg, um, a, an Eastern European metro, uh, I forget whether it's Budapest or Moscow, uh, Paris Metro, Hong Kong, and Hamburg on the bottom right. In 2005, I was promoted to what job I call Head of Train Systems. In the nine years of doing that role, it wasn't always Head of Train Systems. It was sometimes Head of Train Systems a permanent way, sometimes Head of Train Systems and Telecommunications, uh, Head of Train Systems and Integration, Head of Train Systems and Power. 
I was responsible for the teams in the rolling stock signals in permanent way through throughout that time, but at different times power and telecoms and others were added, depending on the various reorganizations that took place. There was also the big event of 2012, of course, and it was a critically important event for the UK, for TfL and for London. The general mood of the media had been, it'll be a disaster because of the unreliability of transport in London. I'm sure you all remember that. As far as the staff were concerned, I believe it galvanised everyone in the team along the lines of Will Showham. Pretty much everything that anyone thought reasonably needed to be done was done in order to improve the reliability in the run-up to the Olympic Games. And reliability did indeed uh, climb to record levels. During the Games, LU cleared all non-operational managers out of the offices and used them as travel ambassadors in their pink, sorry, magenta tabards to help people get around London. Uh, this was a, an extremely entertaining time for me. At Stratford Station, I spent many happy hours acting as a human barrier, keeping a one-way system going on the high-level concourse over the Stratford International DLR platforms. And at London Bridge, with Graham Miller, who many of you know, helping people find the various tourist sites nearby. To avoid Stratford Station being overloaded, travel ambassadors were drafted into the Olympic Park to encourage visitors to walk down the Greenway to West Ham. This is something I've no idea whether we made a difference, but I do know that the transport system worked almost faultlessly, and possibly the best advert for that was that many of the special transport facilities put in place for the athletes went unused as the athletes chose to travel by by public transport. Now I've taken D-Stock out of sequence for a reason. And again, it brackets the two ends of my career. When I was in the design division after training, pretty much the first thing I was involved in was working on the various items of equipment, the auxiliary equipment were responsible for, for the D-Stock. Relays, switches, contactors, fans, heaters, and so on. It was a fantastic way of learning my craft because I would need to understand a little bit about how these systems worked and which the equipment was to be fitted uh, in order to make sure I recommended the exact right equipment to be used in particular circuits. Later, uh, partway through my career, I was involved in the mitigations to various problems that were discovered with the trailer cars when we discovered that they were a little bit prone to derailment on particular track conditions. These track conditions were carefully monitored and eliminated, but even so, uh, this was a fault that needed to be fixed, and as were uh, faults with cracking bogies in the uh, motor cars in quite similar places to what we'd seen on the 1983 tube stock I talked about earlier. So it was decided to replace the bogies and they were replaced with a, a design that had flexible joints in them so that they would uh, be far less stiff than the bogies they replaced. This replacement happened about year 2000 approximately. Come towards the end of my career, and it had become known that the trains were planned for retirement early because of the order for S-Stock. And my old colleague from the Adhesion Working Group days and the former school chum, Adrian Shooter, had retired from Chiltern Railways. And he said he wanted to talk to me about the D-Stock one day and invited me to dinner. He said he was leading a group that was interested in repurposing the trains for secondary routes, I was thinking of buying some. And I think probably you all know about uh, Viva Rail now, uh, and I believe he's already talked to the friends. Um, and I think it was the replacement bogies that clinched it for him, because when he'd been discussing it with other people, someone had told him that uh, he needed to be wary of those trains because they were prone to derailment. And I was able to reassure him 
that uh, A, the bodies were in good condition, and B, so were the bogeys, and they weren't prone to derailment anymore. Anyway, you've heard the rest from Adrian, and, I and there's a, um, a video on YouTube, but you can see a couple of examples of the Viva Rail product um, on the pictures on the right here. And we're getting close to the end now, but another of the things I enjoyed working with towards the end of my career, again, very high level. This was an, in the, uh, the position of receiving assurance through the director's risk and assurance team, uh, which was the board, effectively the board safety committee, um, was receiving assurance from all those who had been involved in planning for Metropolitan 150. If you'd asked me, in perhaps in 2010, whether we'd run a steam train on the Circle Line, I'd have expressed some surprise. But the quality and extent of the planning that went into this particular exercise by um, all the people involved, particularly Andy Barr and Dave Brabham, who people I'm sure you're familiar with, um, was, uh, was absolutely first rate. I was privileged to be invited to travel on the first run um, on Sarah Siddons. And I'm sure one of the things that helped make sure there wasn't too much steam and smoke in the tube tunnels was the regular messages over the radio from Andy Barr shouting to the drivers on, the, on Sarah Siddons, push! Um, so Sarah Siddons would give the trainer a shove and reduce the amount of work that the steam loco had to do. It was clear that it was a worthwhile venture from the many happy smiling faces that one saw on the platforms as, as one went through. And finally, pretty much the last thing I did when I was just before I retired was to review the first draft of the specification for the Piccadilly line trains. And this is where I tried to justify my 100 years. Um, I'd spent a lot of time in the 2000s, working on how we might deliver a train that was S-stock tube version, all double doors, walk through gangways and air conditioning. And I know many of you will be saying, well, we can't have air conditioning on the tube. Many of you will have heard people say that it was not possible to have air conditioning on the tube. There'd be too much heat. But in practice, what was necessary was an energy management balance to make sure that the heat would be properly discharged. I came up with a variety of ideas of how a train might be reconfigured to accommodate all double doors. And this is where articulation came back again. It involved shortening the cars, eliminating the single end doors, and putting the bogies in different places. And you can see two of the ideas where the bogies might be accommodated in the illustrations on the left of the render that was produced by uh, Priestman Good for TFL in a design study. Having come up with some ideas, we invited the industry to look at our ideas and come back with their own ideas as to what we might do. And that led to some design studies before handing over to a project team that was set up in about 2010. The project team produced their first draft specification, which I say I re reviewed in 2014. After the specification review, invitations to tender were issued, leading to Siemens being given a contract in 2018. Siemens have yet to declare how they are going to meet the specification. So that represents the question marks at the bottom of this slide. But the first trains are due into service in 2024-2025. And that's how I um, claim that I've somehow been involved in 100 years of tube trains. I hope that's not too convoluted. Since retirement, I, play, I, I went into consultancy and work with others on a variety of projects. I've done some bits of work around DLR, a 
little bit of work in Liverpool, uh, a tiny piece of work for Irish Railways, a little bit for South Western Railway, a bit in Sydney, some in Croydon. Um, and I do some writing for the Rail Engineer magazine. Um, in my spare time, I've helped to set up and chair a multi-academy trust in, uh, with two large secondary schools in Milton Keynes. So I think probably having taken you through um, 100 years of virtual time and 51 years of elapsed time, it's time to end. So I thank you all for listening. I hope you found the canter over my career interesting. Preparing this has helped me unearth some images I thought I'd lost forever. Finally, and, but most importantly, I'd like to thank the very many people I've worked with over the years. I believe that whatever we've delivered has always been a team effort. And I know that everything I've talked about has only happened because of the excellent teams working on them. I may have been in the lead and, and made some small contribution, but in general, they did all the hard work. So thank you all. And um, if you're at the premiere, there'll be an opportunity for questions. Otherwise, no doubt you can leave some comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Malcolm. Yours is a truly remarkable career and one that has played a part in so many interesting and important developments. As always, it's fascinating to hear not only about what happened, but about the why and the how. And it's fascinating to see how your lifelong career with Underground Rolling Stock was effectively bookmarked by the same issue, articulation, and indeed by the life, the ongoing life of D-Stock. Now, a plea to our audience, if you're watching this presentation but are not already a friend, please do think about joining us. It's a great way of supporting the museum in what are still difficult times. Membership details and benefits can be found on the Friends website. Thanks again to Malcolm for sharing his recollections with us, and thanks to everyone for watching. Join us again soon for another of our at-home presentations.